Hey everybody, this is Minion Soldier, and this is Calling All Minions, the answer to the missing Calling All Devs show, where we go, we take on the questions of the community, and try to answer them as best we can, even though I am not a game developer. I hope I can give some clear and concise answers as to why, you know, these issues are here. And with that, first one, What's the status of implementation of the Vulcan? Superpat asks. Uh, what's the status of the implementation of the Vulcan? Haven't heard about it in a while. Um, the Vulcan's kind of a weird case. I kind of thought it would be implemented prior to now. Uh, obviously, there would be a very clear use for it in uh, Squadron 42, rearming, repairing, refueling the player ship while they're mid-mission, if that is something that we they intend for us to do. And given what we saw in the Vertical Slice demo, they do intend for missions to be fairly long-ranging and uh, take quite some time to complete. So it's obvious that a ship like this uh, would be very useful as a tool in the toolkit that devs could have to uh, lengthen missions or to make, you know, make much more involved uh, functionality with, uh, within the missions other than just fly around, shoot things. So, I'm kind of surprised that it hasn't made it onto the production timetable. Though, I think that it... I don't want to say that it might be under wraps. But, I feel that its obvious use within Squadron 42 leads me to believe that it, it has to be at some, at, at some level. This is clearly something that they would want to have around. Unless, of course, maybe they kind of looked at it and said, you know, this is just an added thing that might complicate the production more. And so maybe they've set it aside and they said, well, we'll come back to it for the Star Citizen universe. I'm to say, you know, my opinion is just that I'm surprised that it hasn't been finished yet. I would have figured it would certainly have made it into Squadron 42. It, you know, it obviously has a use there. So I'm kind of surprised that we haven't seen it. So maybe they are working on it. It's just going to be like, hey, hey surprise, Vulcan. Uh, but chances are they're probably not. And maybe it's going to be something that's going to turn up a little bit later down the road. Though I would be surprised if it did. First and third person view inconsistency. Wes, all right. Why is there such a different... Why is there such a difference in haziness when in first and third person? Often times players must go in the third person view to be able to see. All right. Well, I guarantee you one, this is not my alt making this uh, request. <laughs> um, when something's right up in your face, obviously it's going to be it's going to be much more impactful in your view than if you're viewing it from a distance. And that's kind of what third person is. So that's kind of where some of that comes in it's just natural right but at the same time you know star citizen and squadron 42 are built to be very cinematic universes and so they do tend to go a little bit heavy-handed on the on the fog effects and all that sometimes not to the betterment of the game sometimes it's a little over the top and so that's probably uh what you're talking about and other things might be just uh you know the way that things are rendering right now that may not be the intended final appearance and it's just this is kind of where we've gotten it to at this point and we're going to come back and revisit it later on so there could be that but in general um you know, it, I, I liken it to kind of like quantum travel, right? When you travel with your ship in quantum, if you've been around since, uh, you know, 2.0 and when we first got that kind of that big universe, sort of, uh, the areas around Crusader, when you used to travel through quantum, right? It was just a very clean view of your ship traveling through this kind of quantum tunnel effect. And it was really, really cool. It looked really, really great. But subsequently, a lot more has been added to it. And while the overall effect of the tunnel around your ship, I would say, has improved, you know, it's all the sparklies and all the particles coming off of your ship it looks a little bit over the top. 
and a little bit cartoony and um, I don't think that it's really done all that much for the game in terms of appearance I, I would say that it's actually kind of gone the reverse it's they've kind of overdone it and so it's probably gonna be something that's gonna be tamed at some point in the future someone's gonna look at it and say yeah that, that looks like it doesn't belong you know in in the realistic uh, first-person universe it looks a little a little over the top and with the smoke and the haze effects and all that it, they do tend to be a little heavy-handed when they introduce these things like "Ooh, look what I can do and so chances are um, a lot of these things are going to be tamed I mean especially if you go and you land on Daymar nowadays um, you get this weird kind of hazy effect which I guess is supposed to be the heat uh, the heat of the atmosphere uh, down uh, near the surface and it ends up kind of having a, a bit of a, almost a watery effect because it's been so overdone so chances are you're probably going to see that tamed at some point in the future when cooler heads prevail uh, mm, I don't know about that <laughs> all right sorry if I was too loud uh, why does my space girl have a cardiac condition flute ass come on CIG you made me wait five years for a female avatar and she has cardiac issues at rest in her ECG trace so the ECG trace um, it's meant to kind of be a little bit immersive but it's not meant to be real um, it's more a reflection of your character at rest uh, your character winded, your character under heavy physical stress and having to run around and do all these different things. It's more meant to kind of give you um, a status of that uh, of that system with your character rather than um, being reflective of a real ECG trace. So that is kind of uh, what that system is. It's not really meant to be realistic. It's more like, I mean, it would be like the HP bar on your character in a traditional MMO. Um, it's, you know, it's not like everybody walks around. It's like, hey, I've got 115 hit points. I've got 112, you know, I've got 175. I'm better than you. You know, it's, it's, it's not really realistic people aren't like that in real life but it's reflective of a system in the game and so the ECG trace is once again reflective of a system within the game and not really reflective of realism though to a certain degree I do agree with you how can uh, you know a supposedly former military uh, you know officer or you know soldier or whatever uh, be so easily winded when running around even in light armor seems a little bit unrealistic so that might also be part of the issue is that that system is a little bit uh over the top all right hephaestus nixia we're we need more info about aspects of the exploration mechanics to make informed decisions about ships uh, trying to compare I'm not by the way I'm not laughing at you uh, <laughs> uh, the freelancer Durr and the constellation Aquila the Drake Corsair and the Carrick is difficult because there are too many unknowns uh, for example since the Durr the Aquila the Corsair each can take a crew of four assuming the exploration mechanics are the same for each then putting aside cargo and price it really seems that the Corsair is a clear winner here not really um, and that is assuming that the Carrick is the best at everything involving exploration as has been built, but is that true? Um, but are exploration mechanics the same for each? Does extra stuff in the Dur mean that it can take its, make its own quantum fuel? Has, has that uh, been suggested? Is there, is this common to all exploration ships or unique to the Dur? So let me, um, let me get down to the meat and potatoes of the issue is you see that exploration in terms of like let's say scanning an asteroid that no one's ever scanned before you know the Carrick might do it a heck of a lot faster um the Dur might be able to get there a lot more efficiently uh the Corsair might take a little bit longer but be able to do so like might be able to maneuver around and fly around at normal speeds a lot more nimbly 
than the other ships could faster quite possibly you know there are different you know surrounding features to those ships i mean i don't think you're going to see too much of a variance within um scanning and exploration at too much depth in that beyond um the type of equipment you bring to do the job like the mark one scanner takes one minute to render this data whereas the mark two takes you know 45 seconds and the mark three takes 30 seconds you know and each one costs you know varying amounts ever increasing so that's probably where that's going to lie i would not um i would not make decisions based on solely on what's in the brochure because the brochure is kind of bullshit it's just you know i mean you you hear the devs say it when they're talking about it they say oh well marketing comes up with that stuff and sometimes we're surprised by what marketing puts in there so I wouldn't put too much faith in the brochures. It's mainly just flavor text and a lot of BS, but you know, you go in there, you go, here's some nice pictures. Here's generally what they've talked about, but whether it's set in stone, I find that a little bit sketchy. Uh, so I would say buy the ship that best suits the mission profile that you expect to uh, expect to expect to need do you need something that's maybe more long range and maybe much more friendly to the crew over long distances Carrick clear winner uh, do you need something that can get in and out of trouble areas quickly probably Corsair do you need something that's cheaper on fuel and easy to maintain probably the Dur. Um, as for the Connie Aquila no I would never do that to anybody even my worst enemy um, Friends don't let friends fly Connie's. Um, I'm sorry. But yeah, that's how I would go about figuring that out. All right. Even Georgiev. Sorry if I mispronounced that. Uh, next star system. Which star system will be the next in line for development after Stanton is finished? If you go to the star map and you look up Stanton, you'll see the systems that are connected to Stanton. And I would probably expect it to be one of those. No, I'm not touching that. Um, Aqua ID. Mercury Star Runner weapons versus Corsairs. Hey, after Corsair, it seems very unfair that the same price ships has so difference with weapon size. Uh, do you think about increased weapon size for the Mercury? Thank you. No. Um, yeah, so short answer, no. Uh, long answer is the Mercury Star Runner and the Corsair have two entirely different mission profiles. The Mercury Star Runner is a smuggling ship. It's not meant to stay and fight. It's specialized to avoid fights. It's specialized to avoid confrontations. It's meant to run. So between the two ships, you're probably going to see the Star Runner being the fastest ship. It's not meant to engage in direct combat. It's meant to evade combat. Whereas the Corsair is more combat oriented. So you're probably not going to see as much speed, but you're going to see a lot more of its available power going to systems like shields and weapons. So, you know, it's going to end up... Uh, it's not going to end up getting a weapon size upgrade at all unless it's so insufficient in its engines that it, it just needs it. Otherwise, it's just dead meat. But, you know, as its main feature is its engines, you're never going to see a weapon size increase on the Mercury Star Runner. It's, it's just not meant for direct combat. It's meant to avoid it. Uh, let's see. Let's let's finish it with a good one. Let's see. Something with some substance. Something. Uh, mm, nah. All right. 
Karogi asks, will there be limits of players per server or will they all be on the same server? Everyone's going to be on the same world server, but they are not all going to be in the same instances. They're, everything is going to be instanced and it's going to be kind of like these fluid instances where whatever the upper limit is, the computer is going to try and or the servers are going to try to maintain around that. They're going to have to work around things like group size and stuff like that. So there's going to be certainly some room for hijinks there. But yeah, everyone is going to be on the same server. There's going to there's obviously some room for abuse within a system like that. How they plan to solve that, I have no idea. I really, really don't. Uh, best of luck on that, but I don't know. I mean, you think about it. Let's say there's a 100 player limit on an instance on the instance that is the immediate environs of you and your group. Well, if the limit is 100 players and you bring 100 players, how can you get any other players into that instance, right? So let's say you're running cargo and you decide to run the most expensive cargo through the most dangerous parts of space, you know, filled with the worst of the worst pirates. And all of a sudden you've maxed out that instance limit. So now you can go and you can make those cargo runs for free and all you have to worry about is NPCs because you can't get any other players into that instance in order to provide any other added level of challenge. So, you know, oftentimes this is one of the things in the back of my head when people are like, oh my God, piracy, it's ruining the game. It's like, there's a lot of problems to solve and piracy may be for organized players, for players with basic social capabilities, um, piracy may be non-existent for them because of a system like this. So it's gonna be very interesting to see how all of that shakes out in the end. Anyways, that's the episode for today. I hope you guys enjoyed it and thanks for watching. Thank you, thank you, thank you for watching. So, so, so if you wanna keep up with the latest and greatest in Star Citizen and Squadron 42's development, please follow, please follow, please follow us on our social media channels. See you soon.